Today is July 13th, 2007, Friday the 13th, but it's a lucky day for us. Always. Uh, we have as our guest today Frank Williams uh, for an oral history interview. I'm Chuck Lundquist. Frank, it's good to have you here, and I'll not try to squeeze your hand too hard okay. this time. <laughs> Can you start out by telling us a little bit about where you spent your youth, and where you were educated, and how you got into the space program? All righty. Well, uh, I was born and raised in a little town called Fairfield, Alabama, a suburb of Birmingham, and into a good Christian family, I'm happy to say. It started me out right. Uh, I have two brothers, uh, younger than I am. Uh, who are both still living. My parents have are deceased at this point in time. I graduated from Fairfield High School. I immediately went off to Auburn to, to be an aeronautical engineer. I loved airplanes and built them as a youth, and I figured if I, that's what I wanted to do in my career, so if I was going to do that, I better be an aeronautical engineer. My dad was an engineer out of Georgia Tech. Okay. And so I did that, and... Uh, was in love with uh, a little girl that I was dating, and after two years of back and forth between Auburn and Birmingham, I finally told her, look, I need more time to study, and either we're going to have to put things on hold or get married, because I can't afford to come back and forth every weekend. It's cutting into my study time. So we got married, and she moved down and helped me work my way through Auburn. And education-wise, uh, a few years later, two years later to be exact, I went back to graduate school at the auspices of the Air Force, Air Force Institute of Technology, and got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from MIT. Were you in the Air Force? I was an Air Force officer at the time. I had requested to go back to graduate school uh, to study a very specific topic, uh, nuclear weapons effects of aircraft which was what I was doing while I was on active duty with the Air Force. How did you happen to get into the Air Force? You skipped over that. Oh, okay. Well, I took ROTC in undergraduate school. And uh, you're not old enough to remember this. No, you are. You're, we're about the same age. Uh, the Korean conflict came up, and I was called on active duty after I graduated from, uh, from ROTC, well, from college and had my ROTC commission. I was called on active duty. I was working at Langley Research Center, uh, which was the NACA Center prior to NASA uh, at the time. And uh, they were calling a lot of engineers on board and make, uh, offering us assignments in the engineering domain. So I selected uh, Wright Field and was lucky enough to get it. And I worked in the aircraft lab at Wright Field and I had several various flight test activities that I worked on, but nuclear weapons were in the development at those that point in time, or larger ones. And there was a big concern about, well, how big a weapon can we deliver and not blow up the airplane that dropped the bomb? So I was assigned to get into that business to answer those kinds of questions. So. That's how I got in the Air Force, and that's how I was in that business. What years were those? Well, I went on active duty in 51, and uh, shortly after I was there, they were having a big, well, they had some tests in Nevada. So I had a P-47 that we instrumented and set on the ground on the uh, desert floor there, uh, away from the bomb, and uh, instrumented it when the weapon went off. That it, destroyed the airplane, and from that we decided we knew kind of what the energy propagation was, what it did to the aircraft, and that sort of thing. And uh, that same year, I didn't have anything to do with this particular job, but that project was put some B-17s up. So they drone B-17s near the bomb when it went off, and the only one that was close enough to get any data uh, after the test was over. It came in to land at a little uh, air, aircraft station. It's an Air Force station between Nevada Proving Grounds and Las Vegas, Indian Springs. It touched down to land. It was the drone. And uh, 
lo and behold, the, the tires blew and it went off the end of the runway and blew up and burned all the records, so we never got anything from that. But uh, the next year, they were going to have the first thermonuclear weapon out in the Pacific. And so uh, I drew the lot of being part of that uh, operation. So I went to the Pacific and the old B-36, the 10-engine B-36. In fact, that was we were the closest people to the first hydrogen weapon that was ever really? detonated. Now, That's quite an experience. It was uh, an exciting experience. Uh, the inside of the airplane filled up with smoke. Uh, we buckled the uh, fuselage a little bit, blew in, blew the radome, I mean the uh, Bombay doors, wrinkled, uh, bent the fuselage. Uh, and we got a pretty good handle on what kind of delivery capabilities uh, B-36 had. Uh, we then later the next spring went to Nevada and participated in some more tests there and got the B-36 capability pretty well nailed down and the B-52 was coming along and I said, boy, our theory isn't as good as we thought it was so uh, I'd like to go back to graduate school and work on that. And so I was lucky enough to convince them to send me to graduate school so uh, I went to MIT did my thesis on the uh, effects of nuclear weapons on aircraft and came back then to take over the B-52 flight test program as a crew member out in Seattle and then after that to take it to the Pacific for uh, the next series of nuclear weapons there where the first hydrogen weapon was dropped and again the drop ship dropped it and broke away and we flew in closer to get the effects of that on a B-52 and uh, we were quite successful there, and it was equal as exciting. I dare say. We uh, buckled the Bombay doors again, blew the ECM radome off, uh, exceeded the Gs of the aircraft, but fortunately it was a shock-type load. Uh, we uh, cracked the windshield, did a few other things. Did you run into Ed Teller? Of all of this. No, never did run into him. Uh, the uh, Alan Dulles was out with the AEC. Mm -hmm. one, one, one of the thrills we had that was on the on the B-52 mission. We had a flyby because the Secretary of Defense was coming out with a bunch of dignitaries, and uh, so we had staged a uh, flyby of the B-52, a B-47, B-66, two 84s, F-84s and a 101, F-101, and uh, happened to be in the officers club the night before the flyby was to take place and uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Charlie Wilson uh, Engine came, Charlie. Engine Charlie came around, he was talking to different people and we invited him to sit with us, we, he did, and he said, you know, I've always wanted to, he, we identified ourselves as the B-52 crew, he said, I've always wanted wanted to fly in one of those. I said, well, we got a flyby tomorrow. Why don't you go with us? I said, the flyby's for you, but, uh, uh, no, the aircraft commander told him that. The flyby's really for you, but uh, if you want to go, we'll have a seat for you. So uh, he said, well, let me let me think about it. I said, well, I said, you're the ranking person in the whole, of everybody on the island, so uh, you ought to be able to convince them that you can do it. So sure enough, he did over several people's objections. So he flew with us in the B-52 for the flyby. So that was the ranking person that I met while I was out there. There were a lot of generals around. Oh, very good. So you went to graduate school. And, yeah. And then you had some more time in the Air Force. When did you get out of the Air Force? Well, I'd planned to make a career of the Air Force at this point. This was in... Uh, 1957, I got back from the nuclear weapons test and ran several other programs. And uh, I was due for a permanent change of station. And uh, missiles were being flown at that point in time, a big thing. I said, gee, space flight is, in my mind, was just around the corner. And uh, I'd really like to be a part of that. Boy, to fly into space, that would be where it's at. So, uh, so I'll see if I can't get a missile assignment because I was due for a transfer. So I shopped around and they had, at that point in time, uh, 
what was called named assignments. You could get a named assignment and had direct credentials. You could probably get it. So I had named assignments to go to BMD. Uh, General Shriver just set up Ballistic Missile Division in, in uh, Air Force in Los Angeles. We were flying uh, pilotless aircraft at Eglin, so I checked there and got a position, got an opportunity there. They were launching missiles at the Cape, which is an Air Force station there, so I got one there. He went up to Tullahoma, and because I had aerodynamics in my background and with the high-speed wind tunnels there, got one from there as well. And uh, so when the time came, the word came down, they wanted me to go to headquarters, ARD, Air Research and Development Command, in Baltimore. Well, I didn't want to live in Baltimore, and I sure as heck didn't want a desk job in the headquarters operation. So I talked to some high-ranking officer friends of mine, and they said, well, look, we don't, we just don't diddle with other people's career. And uh, one of them said, why don't you just write the Air Force a letter and say, hey, I've got these named assignments, and I'll accept any one of them, or not, better yet, pick the best two or three and say, I'd prefer this one, but I'll take either of those instead of going to ARDC headquarters. And I said, but, and they, and they said, then add, and if I can't get either of those, then I'd like to be released from active duty. Well, with your efficiency report, you ought to get it. I said, okay. So I wrote the letter, and the answer came back. Uh, when do you want out? Oh, really? So uh, I said, well, I think I said 90 days. Yeah, 90 days. And I didn't know what I was going to do at that point in time. I figured my career, I'd, I'd shot myself in the foot with, from a career standpoint in the Air Force. So, And I looked around and I said, well, if I'm really serious, where is the best place to go to learn missiles, rockets, and that sort of thing? Well, there wasn't but one place, Huntsville, Alabama. So I set up an interview. I talked to several aircraft companies that were in the missile and uh, aircraft business and had offers there, but uh, had an offer. This was in September, uh, the interview was in September 1957. So I came down and interviewed and got offered a job in uh, the S&M lab at ABMA. And uh, I accepted it and told them I'd be released from active duty in January and would report here immediately thereafter, and they said, fine. So, well, you know what happened Sputnik from, sep from September to, to February. Sputnik 1, the Vanguard blew up, and Explorer 1 was launched. So, talk about perfect timing. I got here right after Explorer 1. In fact, my first job after I got here, uh, mine and a small group of us was to come up with some follow-on missions and explorers and uh, launch vehicles and improve the payload capability so we can do more. Who were you working with at that time? Uh, Herman Kurla and Maratzik was the lab director at the time. Yeah, Herman was quite a fellow. Oh, yes. Still communicate with Herman. I've, in fact, I've been to Berlin and lectured at, uh, in, his, in his school there. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Has he retired? He is retired. Of course, you're a professor for life. Yes. yes. He's still very active, still writing. Uh, we communicate uh, ooh, a number of times. In fact, he just sent me a couple of months ago uh, a new uh, uh, chapter in uh, building a base on the moon or building a, a lo the logistics for a moon base. That, that's a better characteristic of it. A characterization of it, but uh, no, I've maintained my contact with uh, he, Rupa, uh, Horst Tomei. I did there. In fact, lectured for Horst at uh, the University of Munich at uh, Aachen, and uh, Rupa at the University of uh, Munich. But Horst died. But I still communicate with uh, with uh, Rupa. That's the only ones that left to go back over there. The rest of them, I'm here a lot, keep up with guys like Connie Dannenberg and Ernst Stuhlinger and the whole crowd. So you worked on the early planning for the early satellites. Then. Yeah. In fact, uh, we put a report out. Uh, Von Braun was on uh, a national committee for launch 
National Launch Vehicle Committee that, uh, who was the deputy? Siemens? No, no, that was from the old NACA days. Uh, Newell? No. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't want to say, start with a D. One of my senior moments. All right. But anyway, he headed the committee, and Schriever was on it, uh, uh, Dempsey, General Dynamics, uh, I've forgotten who some of the others were. The Navy was represented, Abe Hyatt, the Navy, NRL. But, uh, and Warner was on that committee, and uh, he needed a little bit of support or help or, you know, think pieces. So I was lucky. I wound up uh, finding out what he wanted, putting together packages for him to take off to the meetings. Did that for two or three of the meetings, and then I finally thought, you know what? He'd come back and tell me what happened and what he'd like for the next one. So I thought, I'll show you how sneaky I am. Uh, I thought, well, I'm going to put together a real package because I'd go brief him just before he'd get on the airplane to leave to go to the meeting. Well, I'd put a big package together. And uh, he said, gee whiz, I don't know whether I can absorb all of that. Could you go with me and we can talk about it in the airplane? I said, sure. He said, well, we're going to leave in about two hours. I said, I've got my bag packed and tickets. Bonnie's got his secretary has my tickets. <laughs> so he said, okay. That's real planning. I must That's say. planning. So I went with him on the trip, and he invited me to go to the meeting with him. And uh, we had, they had meetings every two to three months, and there were about four or five other meetings, and I attended all of them. I prepared the material for him, and he got to the point where I'd make the presentation, and he'd kibitz me and that sort of thing. So uh, I got to know him pretty well. In fact, put together a report, uh, in fact, that summer, summer of 58, they called for the advances using the Redstone, the Jupiter. We even looked at using the Thor and the Titan missiles as a base or a booster. And then we had, and you need one to deliver about 30,000 30, pounds of payload and one that will maybe 100,000 pounds of payload. That's what you need. So he gave us a job. Okay, go do a preliminary design of a 30,000 pound uh, booster which we did and finished that fall. That was called the Saturn Booster. Oh, that's interesting. Let me back up just a little bit. Uh, during that early time period, you were uh, with the, the group. The, there were some tests done, some nuclear tests done with some of the Redstone rockets and so forth. Mm -hmm. You were, would have been a natural to get involved in those, did you? No, actually, those took place. They fired the Redstone out of uh, Johnson Island. Yes. That was after uh, that time, and no, I didn't have anything to do with with those programs. I was aware of it. You would have been a natural to be involved yeah, in them. Yeah. Uh, I, although I wore an AEC badge each time I went, and as an addition to my Air Force badge, because we had to position the aircraft. And the AEC would say what the energy propagation would be in space. And then we had, from an engineering standpoint, decided, well, how much are we willing to expose the aircraft to? And uh, so I wore my Air Force hat to do that. Well, some of these, the ones I was asking about, took place after you joined the yeah. Army group. Yeah, I was part of, actually, I was with the Army or maybe even NASA. At those I've forgotten what year that. Well, the Argus experiment, for instance, was in uh, 58. 58? Okay. No. After, after you I, just, I was already here in 58, yeah. Okay, well, I just yeah. wanted to know whether no. you got involved no. in those. No, I wasn't things. involved in those. Your background it would no. have been a natural for you to do so. So you came up with a design that became the Saturn. Yeah. What happened thereafter? Well, uh, we needed money. And... Uh, we were partitioning the Army in Washington for money, and uh, I think it was General Trudeau's office. He was head of R&D, and that's where we wanted the money, out of R&D as opposed to the ordinance. We were, ABMA was part of ordinance. And uh, I dealt with the gentleman there, uh, Nels Parson. He was an Army officer. I think he was a major at the time, or lieutenant colonel maybe. And uh, I'm not sure who in the headquarters, Army headquarters, 
had the idea, well, let's go and talk to ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. And uh, so we briefed, I went up and briefed them on the design and that sort of thing. And I briefed the Army and they in turn we went over and briefed ARPA. We set up a meeting uh, in Huntsville for them to come down and see it because, you know, the Saturn I booster was based on uh, the tank each was a Jupiter center tank and eight redstones around it and using the uh, the old Jupiter engine or modified Jupiter engine. So we invited them to come down and it was, excuse me, two gentlemen, uh, both Navy officers, I think they were both commanders, Bob Freitag, who later was in NASA, and Bob Truax. Yes. Uh, Two very familiar names. And Von Braun knew Bob Truax from the American Rocket Society. That was pre AIAA. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, they came down and we briefed them and everything. And they said, well, let them go back and think about it. They'd be back in about a month. So uh, sure enough, a month later, I think it was about a month, they came back down and uh, we had a meeting. and. Medeiros was there, Von Braun was there, Eberhard Reese was there, I was there, and one or two other ABMA people. Um, I don't want to slight anybody, but I don't remember who they were. And uh, we had already figured out what we were going to ask them for. I searched my notes, and I could not find the number. Uh, but I'm going to use a number, 10 million. That's what we needed. And it would take us about, because uh, we were going to propose a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time that we'd build the booster and put it on the test stand here and fire it. And uh, to use the vernacular, we would be blowing smoke and fire, you know, out of all eight engines. And uh, so they, we, they listened to the presentation and they said, well, uh, we don't have that much money. We have $5 million or whatever. It was half of what we said. And uh, we really like it done in a year. And uh, I heard Eberhard Reese, who was sitting at the table, go, oh. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether it was Von Braun or Medeiros that kicked him under the table because, you know, Eberhard was a conservative of the oh, yeah. crowd and he worried the dollars and the schedule. Yeah. He did with a absolute, you know, iron fist. So uh, everybody looked at Eberhardt and he said, well, I think we can do it. So we got half the money and about uh, three quarters of the time that we wanted. But uh, they wanted it in a year and Eberhardt, bless his heart, came to the rescue because he found more sal salvageable tanks and uh, engines laying around, and he was, uh, good at that. he was good at that sort of thing. So really, the amount of money, with Eberhard's help, we uh, we really made the budget, at least as far as I know. I, quite frankly, at that point in time, I didn't worry about the budget. Uh, I worried about schedule, but not the budget at that point in time. But uh, sure enough, 13 months later, we were blowing smoke out of and fire out of eight engines on test stand down there. What date was that? It was, uh, let's see, we, we got the money in the winter of uh, 59. Yeah, the winter of 59. I don't remember the month. Yeah. But, uh, and so it was the winter of 60, winter to spring of 60. The reason I remember the time because uh, you also recall that there was a big debate, a big, there was a fight going on between the Army and the Air Force as to who had ballistic missile or rocketry. Uh, I remember it well. Okay, the Nickerson trial. In fact, the Nickerson trial was going on when I came down for my interview wearing an Air Force uniform. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I remember because I was up in Washington for another meeting. I was with Nels Parsons again. 
and he invited me out to his house for dinner. And we were sitting in his backyard, uh, as I recall, cooking steaks. And uh, the moon came up over the horizon. He lived in Arlington, as I recall. And he and I were, had been talking about how in the heck are we going to solve this problem with the Air Force? Well, all of a sudden, it's, you know, like the Ford commercial, bing, the light came on. I said, Nell, there's our solution. He said, what are you talking about? I said, that's the solution. And he looked up, the moon? The moon's the solution? I said, that's our solution. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, the military needs high ground. That's the highest ground you've got. And I said, you know, if we can convince the Department of Defense to put a military installation on the moon, who would do it? The Corps of Engineers would build it. SEAL Corps could, could communicate with it. Quartermaster would outfit it. The Medical Corps would handle all that part. I said, all the seven tech services in the Department of Army would be required. It would be an Army job. Plus, in fact, there's no air up there anyway. And we finished our drinks and the steak that night. And he said, what are you going to be doing tomorrow? And I told him what my schedule. And uh, so he said, I'll, 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 let me talk to you. I want to go talk to my boss. So he went in and talked to General Trudeau. And he called me late morning. And he said, could you come over this afternoon? Or maybe it was lunch or afternoon. And... Uh, We've got a meeting with General Trudeau about the topic we talked about last night. I said, you're kidding. Said, no. So Things move fast in those days. That's right. So we met with General Trudeau, and uh, he was on the edge of his seat. I'm not kidding. He, was, he seemed excited. He, we had his attention. Uh, I, went, I left and went back to my hotel and that night, and Nels called me, and he said, hey, we've got a meeting with General Taylor tomorrow. I'm not sure what time it is, or you are going to be in town. And I says, for that, I will be in town. Actually, I'd planned to fly back that day. So uh, he said, meet me in my office first thing in the morning. I said, okay. So I called Von Braun at home. I had his home phone number and uh, told him what had happened. Well, it took me about 15 minutes to convince him, one, I wasn't drunk, and two, I wasn't crazy. <laughs> I told him, I'd say, hey, I spent enough time in the military to know you can, you can go maybe over your boss's head. You can go over somebody's head one, one echelon, but I said, this is three or four echelons, and I cannot afford to go to see the chief of staff of the Army without General Medeiros giving me an okay. And your job is to get Medeiros to give me an okay to go talk to him and what it's about. I told him what it's all about. And he was elated. I mean, he, I said. He I, would have been. Yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, he, he called me the next, or called my hotel the next morning. And uh, no, I take that back. I called his office the next morning. And I told him, get to the Medeiros early in the morning because, you know, Warner, wasn't always there at 8 o'clock. And so he was there at 8 o'clock the next morning. He talked to Medeiros, and I called his office, and he had in fact, just gotten off of the phone, as I recall. And he says, I got Medeiros is okay. So we had a meeting with uh, General Taylor that afternoon. And uh, he uh, gave us the go-ahead. Well, i got to tell you a story about that. Uh, he said, how long would it take? Well, Nels and I hadn't talked about how long it takes, so Nels looked at me, and I looked at Nels, and Trudeau hadn't asked us that question. So I said, well, I said, well, if somebody can really clear the decks, we ought to be able to do it, I'd say, in a year. Nels, what do you think? He said, I think that's, that's a good date, one year. And... Uh, how much would it cost? I said, I have no idea how much it's going to cost. Uh, but uh, we, first thing you have to do, we've got to have the best 
people, most creative individual out of each of the seven tech services. Because, you know, at that point in time, we hadn't even selected astronauts. An astronaut hadn't flown. So we've got to have creative, imaginative people. So hand-picked. And uh, nobody had any objection to that. So General Taylor said, well, uh, can you do it in 90 days? And Nels looked at me, and I looked at Nels. I said, can you get us six months? I said, General, could we have six months? He said, 90 days. And I looked to, at To do what, the study? To do the study. To do the study. And uh, I looked at Nels, and Nels looked at me. <laughs> We'll give it our best shot. I looked at Nelson. We can give it our best shot, but hey, we're going to have to have, you know, carte de blanche. And uh, Trudeau told the general, says, with carte de blanche, we'll do it. Uh, <laughs> Ninety days later, we were back in the general's office, and this happens to be a copy of Three, three volumes of a four-volume document that we presented to him. And uh, brief. What date would that have been, roughly? That was in June of 1958. No, 59. June of 59. Yeah, well, here. But there's signed it. June the 8th, 1959. There was a fourth volume that dealt with weaponry, and uh, there was uh, Q clearance required. So I have had these three volumes uh, declassified. So Lemnitzer, uh, we found out about a, two months later why he wanted it in 90 days, because 90 days after that date, uh, Lemnitzer, I mean, uh, Taylor retired. And Lemonister took over. Now, Gen General Lemonister, uh, for whatever reason, elected not to uh, pursue uh, submitting that to the Department of Defense. Well, Secretary Brucker also attended the briefing. And uh, after a few months, when uh, uh, nothing was happening, uh, Secretary Brucker, through channels, uh, talked to Dr. Van Braun and said, uh, or Medeiros and Van Braun, I don't remember which, or both. He said, I would like that report redone, take the military out of it, and uh, make it a civilian scientific station on the moon. And uh, Van Braun gave me the job of doing that. And it was a Captain Finch. Yes. Remember him? Yeah. He and I locked ourselves in the vault. And also, the secretary wanted it in a hurry, too. Everything was in a hurry back there. And I'll show you some pages. See the blue lines in here? Yes. He and I went through, and we blue lined this thing and rewrote, cut stuff out and rewrote it, and uh, made uh, a civilian version of that. And I carried it to uh, Secretary Brucker. And... Uh, on the date that he asked for it, which was short order. And he said, uh, I think you deserve the right to know what I'm going to do with this. And he says, I'm sending it to the White House. And uh, Ike was president at that point in time. So uh, I'm sure that, oh, and incidentally, I guess about that time NASA was formed. In late 58. Late 58. NASA was formed. And uh, he, uh, the, the White House had, I won't say uh, Ike had, but his staff had the three-volume civilian version of it. And I have heard through uh, uh, reports that uh, he was aware of that, and that contributed to the fact that Von Braun and company was transferred from ABMA to NASA. I don't have any, the only thing I have in writing is 
a letter that uh, York sent transferring this document, or the civilian version of the document, to uh, NASA, to Glennon. I think, yeah, Glennon was administrator then. Uh, so I know it was sent over to NASA, but uh, very shortly thereafter, it was announced that uh, we would become part of NASA. Now, and I remember prior to what you described, many of us expected we were going to be transferred to the Air Force. Yes. It came as a little bit of a surprise that uh, the Marshall Center was, was created as part of NASA rather than as a Air Force entity. Yep. Which, uh, Interesting to know how... Which a few of us took much delight in, <laughs> even though I'm an ex-Air Force officer. In fact, uh, when we came back to present, uh, George, George Lowe, God, I don't know, his name is in here. Lowe was the guy from the, the Corps of Engineers who gave part of the presentation. And uh, the uh, another... The Signal Corps man, uh, his name is in here too. In fact, the, the names of the key participants in the study are, are in, acknowledged in here. Uh, gave the presentation, and after we got through, General Taylor asked, what's the background? What, any, of you, were any of you all in the Army? Well, the one the Signal Corps guy was, uh, the uh, George from the Corps of Engineers was a Naval officer, and I was an Air Force officer. And the whole purpose of the thing was to keep it secret from the Air Force and the other tech, the other services, what the Army was up to. So they got a big chuckle out of that. In fact, got a laugh out of it, particularly when they got to me and I said, well, I'm, a, I'm an ex-Air Force officer. I'm still in the reserves. <laughs> but it's secret, and I live by what the document says. But uh, also, uh, I heard that uh, Brucker, who had friends in high places, when Kennedy was uh, elected president that fall, that uh, he saw that the Kennedy clan were aware of this document. And it just so happened that this document says, and the civilian version did as well, had a schedule that allowed us to land a man on the moon uh, in the decade of the 60s. And uh, through my whole career, I have never, anybody else that have ever written a report on going to the moon before Kennedy made the announcement. So those of us that were aware of this felt like, well, our objective was fulfilled in more ways than one. That's a very interesting piece of history to uh, record for posterity. Well, it's what was even more fun was being part of it. So, what happened next then? Well, uh, we proceeded. Uh, no, pardon the French, but all hell broke loose. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> and you were here. Yes. You know what happened. Uh, thank heavens we had a good administrator of NASA who knew what it took. And uh, he got Congress behind us. Uh, little things. He he got the talent, and I it, I credit the administrator of NASA of seeing that the talent necessary to do the job was brought on board. This was Webb, was it? Yep. Uh, the accepted position, and I don't need to say more. You know what that was. It allowed the agency to really find the, the talent that it needed, bring it on board, and reward it appropriately. At the time, it seemed like it was appropriate. In today's world, it doesn't. But uh, uh, that made it happen. And people like the Warners, the Kurt Debuses, the George Lowe's, Bob Gilruths, uh, the uh, Abe Silversteins, and even the guys in the Navy and the Air Force came around and really made it happen. The doers of this world. A 
very historic period. Yeah. To say the very least. I had a had a ball doing it. Uh, I know once the Apollo program took place, uh, from a very personal standpoint, Warner asked me to come up and be his assistant for a couple of three years, and uh, that was a ball. In fact, he well, told what me. What years were those? Oh lordy, uh, 62, 63, 64, somewhere along in there. I know he told me. He said, you know. Frank, our plate's full. We don't need any new projects. <laughs> we couldn't do them if they gave them to us. And uh, going to the moon was a pretty full. Place. That's right. In fact, see, I, I'm a dreamer. I'm a designer and a planner and that sort of thing. So that's what I love to do. And so he said, uh, I said, well, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. He said, but I, I want, I need you. I'd like for you to work with directly with me. So I said, I can't pass that up, boss. So that was probably the most fun two years of my life, professionally. And uh, so I did that. And he said, when, you know, when, when we can see the, tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, then you want to go back and do that? Well, that's what you'll do. And that's what I did, if you recall. Set of advanced programs, and, uh, which led into program development. And it's a team of people. I brought some of the whole advanced programs, advanced studies office, it was called. The space shuttle, the lunar roving vehicle, uh, all, those things all the space, st the space station, uh, the uh, nuclear ro rocket for uh, transfer to Mars, uh, the NERVA program, you know, all of those things. Uh, that's what I love to do. And that's what he let me do. Uh, made a very good choice. Well, uh, I had fun doing it. Thank you. That's <laughs> I consider that a very big compliment. Well, what happened after that? Well, we did that and uh, uh, got a lot of the programs going. Uh, uh, good old Gene Oliver, I remember he he did the one on the the Mars mission, landing mission, landing a spacecraft on Mars, uh, and. Uh, Dave Paul, who had the lunar program, uh, the lunar roving vehicle. Bless his heart, we had a reduction in force when they canceled the Viking program, so lost a few people, Dave being one of them. Jim Madewell, who went off to Rockwell. When we had the reduction, everybody that I had to let go had a better job for better pay than they did in my office. Goes to Excuse me. Good people. Excuse me. Had good people, and they're still my best friends. Uh, but uh, we were trying to sell a space station, and you know that was about the time Frank Borman got back from the cir circling the moon. And Warner decided, and we were f fighting toothing nail with the Johnson people. Which that goes with the territory. And, uh, oh, Skylab was another big one we had. Skylab, the wet workshop, which finally wound up a dry workshop, but it was still the workshop that we conceived here. Another major program that grew yeah. out of your office. Yeah. And uh, the space shuttle was about to get sold, and uh, the handwriting was on the wall. That sold. So, you know, Warner always wanted the space station. In fact, one of the things that he and I fought uh, or tried to do was get the space station a little bit ahead of the space shuttle and get a little bit smaller space shuttle because that way, uh, you know, you're going to have, when we get to the moon, we'll have a space station and when we get to the moon. But anyway, he said, we got to get the space station sold. So he said, what about you? Frank Borman's back. Why don't you and get together, moved down to Houston, joined forces with Frank Borman and set up a space station task force, which we did. So I agreed, okay, I'll do that and uh, go to uh, move down to, Hunts uh, to Houston. So we set up an office and about that time Johnson, President Johnson, no, no, Nixon, Nixon was president then, sent Frank Borman all over the world as his ambassador, the roving ambassador. And I think Frank made about two or three meetings the next year. He was always on the road. 
but we had people from all around the, the agency. So you had to run things. So I, well, yeah, I ran things in his behalf. And uh, that was a ball, too. And then about uh, the winter of, that'd be 60, yeah, the winter of, no, seven, winter of 70. Yeah, because I was there for the Apollo launch, uh, Apollo 11 launch. Uh, the winter of 70, the handwriting was on the wall. We were not going to get the money for the space station. And that's when uh, Tom Paine and George Lowe convinced Warner to move to Washington. And Warner called me and asked me to come up. He'd like to talk to me. And so I did. And he said he wanted me to go to Washington with him. He said, and uh, I'm sure you're reading the handwriting on the wall that we aren't going to get the money for space station. I said, yep. He said, well, why don't you go back and talk to Frank and y'all just close down the office and uh, you can move to Washington with me and come up in June. I said, sounds like a good deal to me. Because his job, he went up there to really write a long-range plan for the agency. And... Uh, unofficially to be the Mr. As Mr. Spokesman for Congress and of course Warner was a class act when it came to PR and promotion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we put together the long range plan and that was a ball too. And then uh, uh, Tom Payne didn't get the nod for the administrator's job and then Jim Fletcher took over and uh, Things happened, and I'll leave it at that. And we didn't want the long range, or the agency didn't want the long range plan at that point in time. And Warner decided that uh, he would just retire. And uh, so, with that, I went over, uh, I was offered a job with Chuck Matthews, happened to be a good personal friend of mine, to set up a new operation and applications. And to, not to over-dramatize it, but I said, yeah, I'll do that. And, uh, well, Chuck and I had a long talk about what I would do. And he said, you know, just sell new applications programs. Well, communications was already going. Meteor meteorology was already going. And uh, Earth Resources was already going because three of my buddies were running them. So Chuck said, you can have everything else. So I said, all right. So I suggested that he give me a challenge of getting a new program every year. And he said, I can't do that to you. And I said, well, give me a challenge. That's a good one. So he said, OK, but I'm not going to put that in, all in writing. You know, we had our, we had, we, we, we had our contracts. Uh, at least all accepted positions had contracts. So uh, we had a shake hands agreement. And so I worked with him for, for five, almost six years. And we got GOC, Legios, which was built here, designed to the spacecraft. The manufacturing of it was perfected here and built here. Uh, uh, it's one of the longest operating uh, satellites or the longest operating satellites did. That's right. It will it's still being used. It's still being used, and it'll be up there for we figure about a million years, unless somebody brings it home. Uh, then we had CSAT, GravSat, and uh, MagSat. So every year, I got a new program going. I'm the only person in NASA that <laughs> ever got a new program going every year, and quite frankly, never with the support of the administrator. Uh, never forget, uh, we were trying to get uh, CSAT sold. And uh, my approach to the new programs was to get a user agency involved in it. And uh, I, uh, we had, uh, there was a spacecraft planned when I took over for uh, uh, 
uh, an altim had an altimeter on it. I wanted to put an altimeter, but we also put laser corner cubes on it. So we could fire lasers at it and collect the data back and use it for geodetic purposes. And uh, so, and the altimeter, of course, gave us uh, some geodetic data as well, plus oceanographic data. So I approached the Department of Interior, John Noyer, uh, who was DOE at the, no, Noyer. Yeah, he was, he was in G, uh, DOE, I mean, uh, the Department of Interior. And they provided some support. And in fact, every one of my programs had support from the outside world. In fact, there was almost as much Air Force, Navy, and private sources from mineral, um, uh, mineral companies and oceanographic and ocean transit forecasting for ships, ocean shipping forecasting, uh, as NASA put in CSAT, for example. So uh, that let me get things going. And in fact, the administrator called Chuck over one day and said, hey, we probably only get one, one uh, program through this year, and we want to get the large space telescope through. And I talked to Gene Oliver down here and told him what was going on. And uh, Chuck came back and told me, he said, can you delay this? And I said, no, we've already made commitments. And I said, I got too big of an army out there that wants this. How big is your army? <laughs> <laughs> or how big is his army yeah, for the yeah. space telescope? Well, CSAC got approved that year, and space telescope had to get in line for the next year, which didn't suit some, certain people in NASA headquarters very well. CSAC but anyway, was a great success. very great success. And uh, so uh, then uh, there was a change in administration, and the new boss and I knew one another very well. And I decided, hey, mine's my time to get out of here, plus the fact that I wanted to see what the industry was all about. So uh, I accepted a job to set up a new research and development uh, activity, an advanced design group for Mark Marietta down in New Orleans, and for the final development of the, finish the development of the shuttle external tank. So I went there and had a fun 14 years with Mark Marietta. Almost sold the shuttle derived vehicle, which we sure as heck needed to get that space station up, but we're still struggling. And, and you almost sold the use of the external tank, tank. to get the space station. That's right. Remember. Yep. Now that's an interesting story. Why don't you oh. tell a little bit about that? Well, do you know it cost performance of the space shuttle just to drive the external tank back into the atmosphere so it burns up? And uh, you could actually improve the performance of the shuttle if you took the external tank all the way into orbit. And uh, like the, the old wet workshop or the Skylab, you could make a mighty big, nice space station out of that big external tank, which was a large piece of material. Large piece of material. Uh, you could make a Hilton Hotel out of an external tank in terms of the number of rooms you could put in it. Exercise room and everything. Uh, it was too new for the space station crowd. Uh, they did not want to be inhibited. You know, uh, NASA, like any other large organization, industrial or government-wise, has sub-elements and there's the politics within the sub-elements and uh, we didn't have all the right sub elements put put together to make it happen, but it was a it was a fun. Even a company formed. Oh yeah. Try to do that. Yep, and private money put into it, but uh, the space station crowd, uh, who happened to have been at Johnson at the time, just didn't like it. See, the Johnson people didn't like the dry workshop or the wet workshop, and so they. Uh, there's stories I could tell you about that, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> about uh, the transfer of the workshop from Huntsville to, to Houston. But, uh, and the shuttle. Uh, 
could have been a was being proposed by us as an all uh, Huntsville job, but it had people in it. So if people were in it, then Houston had to say. And uh, in fact, what uh, Von Braun and I were really proposing was a much smaller uh, uh, orbiter that uh, was non-propulsive from an ascent standpoint, except for the kick in the apogee. It would be, you could do some maneuvering in orbit and that sort of thing, rendezvousing and that sort of thing. But uh, it was a small, much smaller vehicle that did not need the mass. And if uh, launch it wasn't meant to be a truck, it was to be a it was a to be a, a, a bus people. for people. And uh, uh, I thought, and Von Braun thought as well, independently, uh, that uh, we should have a much smaller orbiter. Uh, take stuff up. They say, well, the excuse was, but if it doesn't work, you can bring it back. Well, hell, if it worked when you started, when it shifted up there, it'll work when you get it there. And if it doesn't, it costs more to bring it up, go up and get it and bring it back than it would to build a new one. So, uh, but uh, things didn't work out the way some of us wanted it or thought it should. But it wasn't, wasn't one of the only things in life that uh, didn't go the way I thought yeah, they ought to. <laughs> there were a few others. Yep. But, uh, Chuck, I, you know, you wind up seeing, meet, meet, as much traveling as I've done. You know, somebody sitting next to you in an airplane, what do you do? Uh, where do you work? And I said, work? Oh, I've never worked a day in my life. Uh, I play for uh, the Air Force, or I play for NASA, or I play for Martin Marietta Corporation. I love what I do. I get up in the morning excited to go to the playpen or my office or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm happy to say my fifth career, that of being retired, uh, is the same way. I look forward to getting up. I'm busy every morning. Uh, I have fun. What do you do to keep busy? Well, I play golf. I'm very active in our church. Uh, I uh, lecture at Auburn. I have, I have not this year. Uh, the guy, uh, Jim Boss, who was an astronaut, I lectured, for, well, I lectured before he was there. I lectured for him every year while he was at Auburn. And uh, I've volunteered to come back, and I, I just haven't been down this year, haven't been invited this year. I haven't waved the flag too loud, but that was a boss. Uh, I get such a charge out of being there, seeing the quality and the attitude of the students today. Uh, I thought they were good when I was there. Uh, I thought they were good when I started lecturing back 15 years ago. Uh, they get better every year. Uh, but I lecture in the engineering department, in fact, just to seniors in the aero department. But I do see what the systems engineering crowd is doing. Uh, in fact, I'm still on the executive engineering council for at Auburn. I don't go to all the meetings anymore. I try to make them if I can. But uh, the systems engineering, the, the getting people from all of the engineering disciplines working together, even with the economist, uh, I see a first-class institution in educating our, our students for today. And I'm sure other colleges is the same way. I know they are. But uh, I tell you, Auburn has an absolutely first-class engineering department, and it is still growing. And with the monies that we're all putting into it, uh, it's going to continue to grow and improve. We will have good scientists and engineers coming out of that place. That makes me feel good. Well, we're getting toward the end, perhaps. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave for the new generation of folks that are going through school and undertaking to go back to the moon. What, yeah, what advice know, would you have? Well, you know, I, I, stress, I, I stress engineering and, and really giving it all you've got. And uh, develop good work and study ethics and uh, take good notes and do all those good things. Get a good education and good moral standard. But don't forget, to, uh, excuse me, I always get emotional when I do this. <laughs> don't forget the three F's. 
because you can be the richest guy, the most powerful guy or gal. And as the gals coming up today, are they blow my mind too. Uh, if you forget the three Fs, you know, you can be the richest, the most powerful person in the world, but you will not get out of life what's the best that life has to offer if you don't have your faith, your family, and your friends. That's my message to them. Have good faith, have good family, and have good friend relationships. And then you can have a great life. Well, that's a wonderful way to end the interview. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure.